Hello, this is Professor Dan Kernler of Elgin Community College. This video is another one in my statistics series. And in this one, this is our second one on graphs. We're gonna to talk today about histograms. Let's get started. So in our first video, we talked about a variety of different graphs we're gonna talk about, and we had skipped histograms. We're gonna talk about those today. Let's start with one from our LGB adults database. Uh, and let's look at the age that the individual realized their sexual orientation. Histogram is pretty straightforward. There are a couple of things we can modify. So we'll go graph histogram. Uh, no surprise there. Uh, choose the variable. And then because we're looking at age, our variables range from pretty small young age up to something like 50. Let's set a minimum of zero and then a class width of five. And like usual, we can modify the x-axis, y-axis, and title, label those appropriately, and then we get a graph that looks something like this. And what those boxes mean, let's look specifically at one, the third box there. Um, it's between 10 and 15. What it specifically means is there are 534 individuals who recognize their sexual orientation between the ages of 10 and 15. Specifically, this is including 10, but not 15. If you think of an inequality, this would be 10 less than or equal to the age, less than 15. So 10 is included, but 15 is not. One thing the histogram does is it lets us look at the distribution shape, how the variable is distributed. So I have four of them up here. The first one is symmetric. So kind of bell-shaped, that's a symmetric distribution. Then we have a uniform distribution where all the intervals have about the same frequency. Then if most of the values are over on the left and then it kind of distributes over on the right, we say that's right skewed or skewed right. And then the last one there, if most of the variables are over on the right and then there's a few to the left, we would say that that is skewed left. Let's look at another variable and kind of do a little deeper dive. This is from our 2018-2019 Illinois school data. Um, we'll make a histogram and let's do the percent of students who identify as black or Hispanic. Uh, every school has to record this. The individual has to pick one of these or the parents have to pick one of these when they sign their children up for school. And so we can do, let's do a relative frequency here. And um, when we choose our labels, let's see our x-axis label here would be the percent of students. And then the y-axis would actually be, since it's relative frequency, our individuals are schools, it would be the proportion of schools. Uh, and then we'll put a title on there and create this graph. This graph is really interesting. If you look over on the right, this, this block here means so that, that, that proportion of schools, over 50% of schools have less than 5% of their students that identify as black or African American. But then there's this little peak over on the right down here. Um, there's another, what would that be? About 8%, 7% of schools, another big peak that have almost all of their students identify as black or African American. And this, this points to something really interesting about Illinois, a lot of America as well, that, that we are very segregated. So there's a lot of schools, the majority of schools in fact, have very few black or African American students. And then there are a few schools where really concentrated, almost all black, black or African American students. So, so let's dive a little bit deeper and think about what might cause that. Um, if you think about the U.S. Census data and the concentration of black or African-American um, residents. Now, you can get this by county uh, and there you can sort by black or African-American total. So if we sort that descending, you can see uh, Illinois Cook County, in fact, has the most. And then there's some in Los Angeles, California, etc. Um, if you sort by proportion, the proportion of the residents that are black or African-American, you get a different order. Here, it's all in the Southeast, Mississippi, Alabama, Virginia, uh, et cetera. Um, there's actually a nice visual of this that came across my Twitter feed a few years ago. It looks something like this. Now, if you think about why that is, it should be pretty obvious, right? These concentrations are because their ancestors were brought here. Why are they so concentrated still? What, what is causing that? 
there's a good reason for this and it's called redlining. There's a long history here. So I wanna talk a little bit about redlining and talk about what this is and what effect it has had and continues to have. So there are these maps and you can see the different colors. Uh, the redlining is because the red areas were the not desirable ones. They were rated A, B, C, and D. Uh, and so D was a hazardous neighborhood. Um, a red neighborhood, and that was um, hazardous in terms of its ability to um, be safe to give loans to. Here's the kicker. Um, these were produced by the federal government, and a single black family living in a neighborhood could cause the whole neighborhood to be rated, rated hazardous, given a red rating. Um, in fact, there's descriptions in some of these redlining documents that are public, Here's one, um, talking about a specific neighborhood, there's a slow encroachment of Negroes, but there's, an, there's a Nicolette Improvement Association that's limiting their spread. Um, here's a neighborhood, probably not an A neighborhood, respectable people, but homes are too near a Negro area. This one gets me every time, 100% poor class Negroes, practically all on relief, but a high wall prevents their spread. So another neighborhood, presumably of white Americans, was so concerned about their property values that they built a wall. They built a wall. Here's some other ones. It was actually legal at this point to refuse to sell your home to someone based on their race. So here is a part of a bill of sale here. This says um, that you can't sell to anyone other than someone of the Caucasian race. Here's a racial restriction within the covenant. No property shall be at, at any time sold, conveyed, rented, or leased to any person not of the white or Caucasian race. So this was actually legal until 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was passed and it no longer was legal. That seems like a long time ago for us to still be so segregated today. Unfortunately, just because it's illegal doesn't mean that it's not happening. In fact, I've got a slew of different things here. Here's a National Fair Housing Alliance settlement from 2017. African-American home buyers often didn't receive a call back. Um, black and Asian home buyers are told about and shown fewer homes than whites. Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, this is one of those matched pairs experiments we've talked about. Uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting found that Blacks and Latinos were denied mortgage at rates uh, far higher than whites, even when you account for income and other economic factors. Um, here's one from Newsday that people were directed to different neighborhoods. Um, if you look at the federal government, the um, Justice Department, they have all of these settlements. Here's one uh, in Indianapolis, there was unlawful redlining. Uh, the Pacific Mercantile Bank, again, discriminating. Here's one in Minneapolis, St. Paul. They were redlining as well there. That was from 2018, 2017. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase, 2017. Uh, Union Savings Bank, again, engaged in redlining. So this continues today. And these are the only ones that have been caught. There's been an investigation. There have been a settlement. Housing continues to be... Uh, rife with discrimination and is a significant cause for the continued segregation within the United States. So why, why am I talking so much about housing? Why is it so important? Is it, is it just an interesting oddity? The big thing here is housing is strongly associated with wealth. If you look at a family's net wealth, that's their assets minus their liabilities. And according to the 2016 Federal Reserve Survey, about 43% of people's net wealth was within their primary residence. So if your family is not allowed to live in a nice neighborhood, there aren't loans available to you, um, and all of those things are limiting you from accruing this family wealth, then when you die, what do you pass down to your, to your next generation? And it simply uh, continues from generation to generation. And now it's created this huge gap where the median net worth for white families is a little over $170,000. The median net worth for black families is 10% of that, $17,600 as of 2016. These are the things that you can't see immediately from the data. 
but the data like this graph can spark you to investigate, well, why is that? We are really segregated in Illinois. What's going on? And dive a little bit deeper. And that's what I want you to be thinking about as you're watching these videos and taking my classes is that there's more to this. We should be doing more than just doing simple calculations and making graphs. We should be trying to answer important questions and looking for interesting patterns and trying to answer things about those questions. That's what statistics does for us. All right, that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this and you wanna see more, you can subscribe, click the bell to get notified. There's a whole series of these coming out. I also wanna take a moment to thank the Elgin Community College Board of Trustees who approved this project as part of my sabbatical during the spring 2021 semester. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I will see you in the next one.